Okay. This is the, um, the annual Cecilia Payne Apostle Lecture. Um, it's given to a distinguished uh, figure in our field in recognition of the uh, extraordinary contributions made by Cecilia Payne Apostle to astrophysics. And I'm pleased to recognize Catherine Harriman Diamond, her daughter, who joins <laughs> us uh, regularly for these, for these, for these lectures. And it's, it's wonderful to have that connection. And we have a particularly good um, exemplar of what the Cecilia Payne Washington Lecture sets out to do today in Deborah Fisher, who is on the faculty at Yale. Um, I promise to be brief, so I will be, but uh, I have to say that Deborah was educated in Iowa and uh, San Francisco State and then got a PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And among the extraordinary techniques that have led to the extraordinary development of extrasolar planet um, discoveries. One of the mainstays um, has been the radial velocity technique. And uh, our speaker today is one of the leading uh, researchers in this area. She has discovered hundreds of extrasolar planets using the radial velocity technique. And she is um, credited with many important results, including the relationship between um, the abundance of gas giant planets and the metallicity of the central star. Um, she's now pursuing, as are some folks here in this room, lower and lower mass planets, and is even pursuing that so far elusive 10 centimeter per second goal um, with, the, with an instrument that will actually go on the Discovery Channel. I like to remind myself that 10 centimeters per second is like a slow stroll. <laughs> it's just an extraordinary notion that you could measure at that level of motion of an entire star. But anyway, I think it's time for me to sit down and hand over to our, our speaker. We'll talk about the search for 100 Earths. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here and great to see so many um, old friends. And uh, I, when I've given this talk before, and the title is The Search for 100 Earths, people have asked, why only 100? <laughs> Which is kind of staggering. Um, and of course, the idea behind this is that you know we want to find as many examples of other planets that are similar to the Earth. Um, because in our slightly myopic view, we imagine that there could be life on those other planets. We believe that life was not a freak accident on this planet, but was actually the outcome of equilibrium chemistry, uh, given the conditions that were here. And so uh, finding other worlds um, kind of makes sense. I also think uh, what I'm doing is, at this point in my career, is m very much uh, trying to be an experimentalist and trying to um, see how far we can push precision. And so the instrument that we're building Expre Express, which will be commissioned next year, is I see it as, you know, my hope is it will be a pathfinder and that it will help us to figure out how we can drive down to uh, better precision for all of the instruments, incredible instruments that are being built. Okay, so in 1990, um, we all had this view that most stars don't form with planets. That went by really quickly. I don't know why. Um, but I, and I remember being here, actually, in this very room and talking to Dimitar Sasilov. Let me just go back, right? Where is that little dancing title? Okay, most stars don't form with planets. And, and, I, and asking Dimitar, but how can that be? I mean, right? And he pointed out that most stars form in clusters and that... Uh, solar evolution by the more massive stars might photoionize the protoplanetary disks, and uh, in fact, that our sun might be unusual. And that's kind of the perspective that we had. Um, and so then, if we look today, we can see that, in fact, uh, this shows the uh, radial velocity detected exoplanets, and I've plotted here the mass of the planets in Earth masses and the orbital period in days. Um, and this is a plot that uh, people have seen. I can drop down Jupiter and Earth, which is kind of a nice thing to do, because then you see right away that we are a long ways away from finding uh, an Earth analog uh, around, let's say, a G-type star. Uh, Proxima is a, <laughs> a new uh, turn of events. 
Um, and if we say that you know we are interested in temperate planets that might have rocky surfaces where water pools um, and life evolves, then we're looking for planets that are kind of similar to the mass of the Earth at distances you know that we call the habitable zone where liquid water could reside on their surface. And so we're really looking to populate the number of detections around in this area. And that's what drives us to trying to reach this absurd goal of a Doppler precision of 10 centimeters per second. Um, right, this was Alpha Sen BB, right, which has been shown to unfortunately be an alias. We now have Proxima, which we could drop down here at 11 days, um, and that would, that would actually fill that region. And around an M dwarf, that would be a perfectly uh, temperate zone for life. And then we have the discovery from Kepler of this incredible uh, wealth watershed of exoplanets shown in gray. Just I kind of overplotted them here in a cartoonish way. Um, but the point was that, you know, at Kepler had a reaction wheel failure. Um, if Kepler had continued going, I personally have no doubt that these low mass planets would have continued to roll out at longer and longer orbital periods. Um, but as it is, you know, there are a few candidates in this area, a few candidate planets. We know their radii, but we don't know their masses, so we don't know how much they are like or unlike the Earth. Um, and so that leaves us wondering, um, what, are there other, what's the technique that's really going to find planets like the Earth in this region? Is it going to be TESS? Um, is it going to be CHEOPS, CHEOPS? Uh, is it going to be PLATO? You know, what, what missions are really going to sort of drive down? And I think, you know, we're hard-pressed looking ahead to imagine what kind of missions might fly or might, or what techniques might actually find uh, Earth analogs. We're in this lucky situation. I love this figure uh, from Andrew Howard's paper in 2012 that shows planet occurrence within 0.2 AU, so these are relatively close planets. Um, I like this because it breaks down the planet detections at the time. Of course, this has been updated since, but as a function of the spectral types. And we can see that really uh, there are you know, gas giant planets, so these are color-coded. The blue histogram shows the planets that are like Jupiter or even bigger. Um, the green is kind of the Neptune to Saturn-sized planets, and the gold is the two to four Earth radii planets. And we can see that for the M and the K and the late type uh, G dwarfs, right, where there's some bias in terms of sensitivity because the stars are getting larger, um, that there are plenty of planets around there. And I don't know how many times in science you can make a statement like this, but we are basically guaranteed a success if we can build an instrument that has the ability to detect these planets. We now know statistically that they're there. This enormous, really, uh, bounty of planets exists. Um, but we have yet to find them around nearby stars. So we've gone from uh, 1990 to 25 years later, where we can make a statement that practically all sun-like stars have planets, that small rocky planets far outnumber the gas giants, and that they preferentially form around perhaps G, K, M type stars, unless there's a selection bias there that rocky planets don't require metal-rich stars, like we found with the gas giant planets, a strong correlation. That gas giants are a more recent addition to planetary architectures. Um, that rocky planets began forming um, as long ago as 11 billion years. And the example is Kepler-444, which just astounds me. Because I remember as we were finding the gas giant planets, wondering, well, the first stars that formed in our galaxy, right, would have been very metal poor, and they surely they couldn't have formed planets. Um, I wonder when we had enough heavy elements um, that stars began forming uh, planet, rocky planets. And so Kepler-444 is the answer to a question that I have always uh, wondered about. If we zoom in on the Kepler discoveries, right, and now we sort not by the sort of cartoonish uh, separation of you know 365 days that I had in my other plot, but we look at the energy that's um, intercepted by the planet, the luminosity from the star, we can see that there are a number of candidates. I think there are now a few more candidates that lie in this interesting zone. 
And then the question is, do we have densities for these planets? There's been, uh, there have been great papers that give statistical uh, analyses of mass radius relationships, but on an individual basis, they're pretty hard to apply. And I found this out when I uh, assigned all of my students are taking, who are taking my introductory origins and the search for life in the universe class are assigned a Kepler multi-planet system on the first day of class. And as we go through and study Stefan Boltzmann and Wien's Law and so forth, they have homework problems that are generic, but then some that apply to their specific systems. And then we have, um, towards the end of the course, um, we have an in-body uh, simulator. We actually are using John Chambers' Mercury Code, where we built a pretty Planet Hunters-like interface. And the students get to run the numerical, uh, dynamical simulations for their multi-planet systems, but they have to be able to fill in the density of the planets. So when they turned in their worksheets and showed me that some planets, apparently, some of these small rocky planets have densities of 20 grams per cubic centimeter, I would ask them, hmm, I wonder what that could be made out of, right? And so then they would go to the periodic table of elements and they would look it up and they would come back to me and they would say, osmium. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so that's driven home for me the idea that we, we just don't really, we don't know the densities for the individual planets very well. So what does the future hold? We've gone from 1990 to, you know, 25, 26 years have gone by. Are we, we'll find more transiting planets, right? Will we get masses? Will we calculate densities? Will we be able to measure exoplanet atmospheres? Will we find biosignatures in those atmospheres? So do we have a future for exoplanets that's full of promise? Uh, NASA is certainly planning, right? Here's the long line of future missions going forward with TEST, uh, TESS, JWST, uh, WFIRST, AFTA, and then maybe eventually uh, some kind of a, a New Worlds telescope, um, something like a HabEx or a Louvre type mission to look at exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and I'm co-chairing uh, this one of these studies, so I'll come back to that at the very last slide of my talk and ask you, uh, you guys for input. But, you know, that's the trajectory that we have ahead of us. And I, I think as I've been chatting with some of you who are working on uh, planetary interiors or exoplanet atmospheres, I ask the question, what if you don't have masses? Is that going to be a problem? And there's always a, a pause and a deep sigh, right, which tells me right away that it actually is, is a problem. That we need to get masses, and without masses, I would say that we are in danger of being in an exoplanet bubble. Right, like a Silicon Valley real estate bubble. It might not be quite that bad, um, but I just think that what I can safely say without being so dramatic is that the future trajectory of exoplanets has a very different slope if we can measure masses with precisions down to, let's say, 10 centimeters per second, or if we're stuck at one meter per second. I think the future of what we can do in terms of characterization is quite different. We really want to go from planet radii to real characterization, and masses are critical for that. Uh, masses give us density for transiting planets, and they're needed for the interpretation of exoplanet atmospheric spectra. There are a lot of ways that we can imagine doing this to get masses. We can uh, measure transit timing variations, and sometimes we get lucky there. Although I think the question is always, with all of these techniques, so what is the precision with which we can get the, extract the masses? Can we do astrometry at the level of nano arc second astrometry, right? So that's one of the things that's being discussed right now, and that's what it would take to be able to measure um, the astrometric wobbles of stars from planets like the Earth. Or will the radial velocity technique come through for us? So I can only tell you about one of these techniques, which I've been thinking about quite a bit. And that's the radial velocity technique. So I feel very lucky that in 1997, I, was, I joined the, uh, the team, right, to, to try and find planets with the Doppler technique. And sort of year after year, you can see that, you know, we were su quite successful. More planets were found um, every year than the year before. And there was this great, you know, trajectory where we were finding planets with lower and lower masses and a lot of these very low mass planets really came from HARPS, right? So what HARPS did that was different was that they invested in the engineering for an amazing spectrograph, and that paid off for them. Um, 
However, I will point out that now in the last six years, we've kind of been stuck at about two Earth masses, with the exception of in 2016, the Proxima Sen B um, planet, which is closer to one Earth mass, uh, M Sinai. And another way to look at this is to plot up the detections by year. And if we color code these uh, by, by the detection technique that was used, so red is the radial velocities, and here I was in the happy days of seeing the radial velocities grow, right, going back to, let's see, Dave, this must be 1980, 1988, 1989, right? Yeah. HD 14, I forgot. 114762. I just needed a little hint, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, but then you can see that the radial velocities are kind of petering out. Um, in contrast, the uh, transit detection technique is just like blowing up, right? This is absolutely incredible. Are we going to see another one of these green bars next year, though? Right? That is a question. Um, so it will take a uh, test to launch and start to give us uh, some more detections in here. And are we going to see a, a lot more radial velocity detections? We certainly are building, as a community, more spectrographs to be able to do this. Um, but the real question for me is, can the radial velocity technique be used to detect new types of planets? Like, honestly, finding one more Saturn or one more Jupiter or one more Neptune is not so interesting to me. I am really, uh, uh, really want to find out if we can push on the precision and, and find planets like the Earth. So um, it, I, I gave you a grim story, right, of how uh, the radial velocity technique isn't doing so well. But I want to show you this, because this, this represents years of my life working at Lick Observatory, observing Tau Ceti, a star that used to be my favorite star, but now I despise it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so this was, you know, the, the, given an unstable spectrograph, this was our poster child. So it's important to remember, right? This was like represented the best that humanity could do in, in the sort of 1990s and, and early, even early 2000s before HARPS came online. And there's, so there's some progress. Um, we built the Chiron spectrograph, which is com uh, commissioned in 2012 at Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile. And we're doing better, um, right? But they're still more scattered than I would like. And I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about that in a moment. Okay, so what is the state of the field, really? Um, we held an extreme precision radial velocity meeting in July of 2015 at Yale, and one of the things we really wanted to assess was exactly where, does, where do we stand. Let's everybody who's doing, working in this business open up your books, and will you be willing to share? Because it's been a fairly closed community. And you can see that, you know, in the olden days working at Lick Observatory or even the McDonald Observatory, this is what the radial velocity precision looked like. And I put a red dashed line along here at one meter per second, because I'm going to now flip to the next page to show you, you know, these are all circa late 1990s kinds of instruments, um, to show you what we're doing right now. So here is HARPS, uh, HARPS North, right? So they are at or below the one meter per second limit. Here's uh, what Chiron is doing, what Keck is doing, what the Planet Finder spectrograph on Magellan is doing, uh, what the APF is doing. So I would say in sort of, you know, the state of the field right now is about one meter per second, plus or minus 0.3 meters per second. That's what we're all really doing. Um, and if we're going to move, we have moved the bar by a factor of 10, right? Going from the plot I showed you in the previous slide, to this plot, we've gone from almost 10, um, 10 meters per second scatter to one meter per second. Um, precision, don't, you cannot underestimate what a difference it makes for precision uh, to have high precision. It's a difference in the efficiency of your program with telescope time uh, and just in what you can detect. So here are some simulations that we ran. This is for 50 observations. If you have a precision of a half a meter per second, you can pretty much clean up, right? And the follow-up for tests is going, would be extraordinary. And I think this is kind of where the field can, can definitely contribute right now. You can also collect more observations. So as you increase the number of observations, then your sensitivity increases. 
But if you can improve the precision to 20 centimeters per second, you know, now with a large number of observations, you're really starting to encroach on this, uh, the detectability for planets that are very much like the Earth. Okay, so why aren't we doing better? Um, I went back and found this uh, nice quote in the paper by Butler et al. in 1996. Ultimately, the limit to velocity precision is set by the stars themselves. On long time scales, uh, stellar magnetic cycles analogous to the solar cycle can insidiously cause apparent periodic changes in the radial velocity. Right? And there were references in this uh, quote to these, to these folks. So I noticed uh, coming in as a postdoc in the 90s that the floor of the radial velocity precision was maybe 5 meters per second. And then we pressed down to 3 meters per second. And now the floor of the radial velocity precision is 1 meter per second. And it was just such a coincidence that that number always happened to match what our precision measurement precision was, right? Our instrumental precision. And so I think, you know, it still is an outstanding question of how low we can go. Okay, so I am going to posit, this is one of my assumptions, which if it's wrong, I hope that you will shoot it down right away, that stellar jitter, that's what I'm calling the, the velocities that originate in the photosphere of the star, have two important properties. First of all, they're not persistent uh, like Keplerian signals. They vary on time scales, um, unless you're very unlucky, that are different from orbital velocities. But even if you have an orbital velocity that's close to, let's say, the rotation period of the star, um, things like spot and spots and faculae will have their own sort of life where the amplitudes will wax and wane. Okay, so that's one of my assumptions. And then the other is that the underlying physical phenomena that cause these photospheric velocities have line-by-line -line spectroscopic signatures that we should be able to distinguish from a Doppler shift. Okay, so. Here's some Chiron data. I have, oh yeah, I hid the name, good. Okay, so this is the radial velocity, and this is the time. And if you looked over this period, you could fit a Keplerian signal to this, and the error bars are about a meter per second, but the variation is, you know, 14.3 meters per second, and it's very a very coherent signal. Uh, this is Epsilon Eridani, and these are radial velocity data um, that we uh, obtained with Chiron. Um, the problem with the Epsilon Eridani data is that <clears throat> if you look at different epochs, so in this red box, those are the, uh, that was the previous slide was a zoom in of the velocities that are, that are in that red box, but you can just see over time that this is a signal whose amplitude is, you know, waxing and waning. It's, it's growing and, and shrinking. So we've been using this star as a case study um, with Chiron to try and understand what's going on. Um, to, to push our understanding of the star Epsilon Eridani, we obtained MOST uh, observations. So the Canadian MOST satellite carried out uh, fairly precise photometric measurements of Epsilon Eridani over something like, well, a couple of orbital periods. So that's got to be about almost 30 days. Um, and then we also obtained radial velocity measurements. Those are shown here on the same nights that the most satellite, well, most was observing, it was uh, continuously, right? And then we could model our a, uh, a, a spot cycle, which would explain both the radial velocity data and the most photometry at the same time, and ended up with, you know, this double spot system that's, uh, in this case, close to the pole. Um, it could be that this isn't a perfectly unique configuration, but it's, it seems pretty clear, right, that the photometric variations that we see in the, with the flux uh, of the star, by measuring the flux of the star, are responsible for the radial velocity variations. Okay, so let's just go in. Um, so I wanted to clarify one thing. Um, since my dear friend Xavier de Musque has uh, uh, the soap paper which talks about spots and plage, uh, plage are things that originate in the chromosphere, um, and the faculae are closer to the, to the surface of the star, closer to the photosphere of the star. Um, and these two things actually have different effects. So in this set of data, we're looking at the H-alpha line right here, and H-alpha will be filled in by emission, which is up in the lower chromosphere, 
And so it's the plage that's causing the flux in the H alpha line to, to bump up um, when we were observing it as we collected our most observations. Right? But that's not a signal necessarily that will cause a Doppler shift. It's very specific to uh, particular uh, transitions. But in the photosphere, I think the real problem is that there are faculae. And these are extended regions uh, around the spot that are a few hundred degrees hotter than the continuum of the, the photosphere from the star. Um, the, of course, the, it's true that the faculae and the plage are tied together by magnetic fields. But my main point here is that we should be probably talking about the faculae um, which are distorting our radial velocity signal by introducing a rotationally linked um, uh, Doppler shift uh, instead of the, the plage, which are in the lower chromosphere. Uh, so the photospheric velocity is affected by pulsations in the star, right? by granulation, which can be suppressed by magnetic fields uh, in area, regions where there are spots, by meridional flows, by magnetic fields, so all of these are spots, plage, faculae, all of these sorts of things. And if these were static, we wouldn't care. We wouldn't care if there was granulation in the star. The problem is that they are not static. They are changing. And any time it changes, you get a time-varying um, change in the line profile shape that can be misinterpreted as a Doppler shift, an orbital Doppler shift. Sorry, they actually are Doppler shifts. Um, <clears throat> And the spot number and the sizes are stochastic, but if we're going to focus on chromospherically inactive stars, then we're talking about you know, sizes that are typically less than 0.1%. So these are pretty uh, tough signals to pull out. OK, here's an observation. Again, I hope I hid the name from you, but maybe some of you will recognize <laughs> the author. So this is the detection of a signal. Right? It persisted. There was data taken in March of 2007, again in April of 2007. So it looks pretty convincing, like a 200 you know, meter per second uh, amplitude. It looks pretty convincing that there is a Jupiter-type planet in a three and a half day orbit. Um, the, the data were obtained using uh, Pharos, which is a high resolution spectrograph. And they, the authors noted that they did not see any line bisector variation. And so that was taken as, as evidence that they were seeing some uh, orbital velocities. Um, but then when we looked, uh, when astronomers looked with using CryRes um, in the H-band, here are the radial velocities, right? Here's the velocity signal that you expect from the optical, and you see absolutely uh, nothing. You don't see that signal in the, in the infrared. So uh, the optical spectrum was uh, seeing spot variations that persisted for several months. OK, so now back to Tau Ceti, <clears throat> the most hated star in the sky. You can see that uh, we work really hard uh, with Chiron to try and you know, extract the highest quality data. And we have our individual error bars are about a half a meter per second. We'll take a few observations per night. But you can already see by eye, just like with the Epsilon Iridani data, that there's some kind of a little wiggle in this data set, right? And if you take a periodogram, the power that comes out happens to be at the rotation period of the star. So OK, there's something on the surface of Tau Ceti, and it's rotating, and that's the signal that we're picking up. Um, so that's not what bothered me. What really bothered me was the Geneva team always telling me, we didn't see that. <laughs> um, so then I became really curious, why is it that I keep picking up the rotationally modulated signals from the surface of the star, and, you know, HARPS uh, seems to be impervious to this. So uh, I got Xavier de Musk to help me with this. We carried out a double-blind study. Uh, he started with his SOAP2 uh, simulation code, which can put spots on the surface of the star and create a time series of uh, spots at different phases on the surface. We started with simulated spectra <clears throat> because we could control the situation. We knew what the answers were, right? Um, and there's something else going on, right? So then the idea would be that we would lace these spectra with iodine. We would put in a PSF, you know, to broaden, convolve the spectra to, to broaden it, just so it would look exactly like the Chiron spectra. 
we would chop it up into the orders. And this would be done with, by Xavier and by Ji Wang, who is my postdoc at the time. And then they would give me the code and I would, or they would give me the spectra and I would just drop them into my, those spectra into my Doppler code, right? And, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any idea what they are. Okay. So, um, right. So the, okay. So the whole advantage here is what we're trying to do is like, we have a lot of things contributing to the error budget. We want to zero out the problems, right? In particular, we want to zero out instrumental differences between, let's say, HARPS or HIRES or Chiron. Um, we want to use exactly the same data set, exactly the same signal to noise, exactly the same resolution, and just do a simple comparison of the CCF and the iodine analysis technique. So it's the Musk versus Fisher. And the results were pretty interesting. Um, so first of all, we had sometimes uh, Xavier put just one spot on the so on the star, <clears throat> and sometimes that spot went behind the star, right? So in that case, you don't expect any velocity variation. And indeed, with the iodine analysis and the cross correlation function, we'll just focus on these two um, methods here. The our data points. Line uh, fell right on top of each other. They agreed to within eight centimeters per second. So that's really great, right? It means that it, it's how it should be, but it's it still is kind of good. The problem came when we let the spot when the spot went across the surface of the star. And again, I I swear I did not know that there was going to be a spot in those spectra. But when we analyze them, and again, let's focus on the black, which is the iodine analysis and the blue, which is the CCF analysis, we did some other tricks and I apologize for complicating this slide, you can see right away that we get different answers. We get the same answers when there's no spots, we get different answers when the spot comes into, into view. Right? Um, in this case, I decided, okay, I don't want to try and solve for the PSF, that's one of the things that we do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the PSF that I know is used, so we even simplified it further, right? This is not a mistake in my ability to model the, the point spread function of the instrument. And the astonishing thing is that the iodine radial velocities had an RMS of 37 in this case, and the cross-correlation radial velocities had an RMS of about 30 meters per second. Okay, so it de the RV answers depend on whether we use this iodine analysis or the cross-correlation technique. It has nothing to do with the instrument, right? And most importantly, it was the presence of spots in this case that were distorting the analysis. No spots, no difference, okay? Not an instrumental effect. Um, so we thought about this quite a bit, and I think our conclusion is that because the cross-correlation technique has these predefined uh, a mask, essentially a, a weighted binary mask, right? They've carefully culled out a lot of lines that might be uh, variable because of activity, or if the activity is just filling up the core of the line, it doesn't matter for the CCF technique. The iodine technique is basically driven by a least squares minimization, right? And the iodine wants to fit, I mean, our, my analysis is a forward modeling technique that wants to fit every single, you know, uh, change in the line profile. So it means that, uh, I think, that the CCF and the iodine analysis do give different answers. Uh, maybe by design, I'm not sure. The CCF is uh, less sensitive to the photospheric velocities, right? Um, but those photospheric, velo those photospheric velocities are imprinted in the spectrum. They do tug the iodine-analyzed radial velocities around more than the CCF. Um, and the iodine uh, analysis models the line depths and the line profiles. It was a big hint that the photospheric velocities were in the spectra, but that they behave differently than a Doppler shift, right? And so that means that maybe we can uh, distinguish them. So um, what we do today, um, and what we've been doing for the last 25 years as in this field of exo Doppler spectroscopy, uh, exoplanet survey things is we take spectra, we analyze the radial velocity, right, and we have one number. And then we say, damn, oh, um, I'm being recorded. <laughs> 
<laughs> Darn, some fraction of the velocity that I just measured uh, came from the photosphere. Um, how, can I, how can I figure out what that unknown fraction was? Was it a little bit? Was it a lot? Can I, how can I chisel it away? Right? I, and so we try things like line bisector variations. Uh, we look at the full width half max uh, variations in the cross-correlation function. We look at correlations with the H alpha or the calcium 2 uh, H and K uh, emission in the line cores. We carry out photometric monitoring. We try Gaussian processes. We do everything we can, right, with that one number to try and say, what fraction of it do I really not want to include in my Doppler measurement to find planets? All these approaches, right, which sometimes work and sometimes don't. We saw very dramatically with the TW Hydra star that was observed with optical spectroscopy, they claim to see no line bisector variations. Um, so the problem, I think, is that all these approaches rely on operating, acting on a single number, the radial velocity measurement, okay? And they could be in sensitive or insensitive to particular types of photospheric velocities or jitter. Uh, in any case, this kind of an analysis can only, can always, only be approximately correct. We will never nail this completely. So let's take a look at what's going on. Here's a spectrum, a solar spectrum shown in black. And in red um, is a spectrum, uh, let's say the black one is a time of low activity. I'm making that up. But, uh, and, the, and then the red is the difference between the time of low activity in the sun and high activity in the sun, right? It's the difference. And we've magnified it, scaled it up, so that we can do a line-by-line -line comparison in this tiny swath of the spectrum. And what you see are that some lines are not very sensitive to changes in activity uh, in the star, and other lines are actually quite sensitive to changes in activity. So um, you might not see this in a line bisector. But if you were looking, instead of just at the radial velocities, if you were looking at every single pixel in the spectrum, and there are 400,000 of them, then you might have some hope of pulling out this difference. So that's what we've been working on for the last year. And by we, I mean um, uh, Jesse Sajewski, who's a stats professor at Yale, Eric Ford at Penn State, Xavier de Musk, who's uh, at, on the Geneva team, um, uh, Jeff Valente, who's at Space Telescope, uh, we've been running uh, simulations uh, where, again, we can control things to see if we can find uh, signs of stellar variability when instead of operating on line bisectors or full with half max, we are actually operating on the 400,000 pixels in the spectrum. Uh, so Xavier simulates the, the data, the time series spectra. He can add spots, faculty. We can add a Doppler shift that represents planets. And, of course, the NSO uh, resolution is something like 500,000, and the signal's noise is, is very high, probably <coughs> greater than 1,000. Okay, so what we've been doing is in this time series stack of data, we've been carrying out principal component analysis, which is going to identify the axes of the largest variability. And we can, once the, the PCA um, axes... Uh, have been defined, um, we can figure out what the sort of the scores of these PCA uh, metrics are. Um, the first thing to note is that here are the scores for a planet, and here are the scores for a spot and for plage, which doesn't look much different. But this red curve looks a lot different from this, the blue and the green curve. Okay, so why haven't we done this before? Why, you know, why are we, you know, always, if we, if we, what we really need is, this is a resolution of 500,000, right? If that's what we really need, um, why haven't we done that? Why haven't we built those spectrographs? And the answer is, these are data that I did with um, one of my graduate students, Jack Moriarty. So we uh, investigated a cross-correlation, starting with the NSO atlas, putting in a Doppler shift, adding noise, right, convolving it, so that it would uh, represent a spectrum that we drew from an instrument with these various resolutions, right? And then we, we said, what is our ability to recover the radial velocity? What's our radial velocity error as a function of signal to noise with these different instruments, these different simulated instruments? 
And you can see that there's a big advantage going from 40,000, you know, down to 60,000. And that's because you're now, you're actually resolving the line shapes, right? And you're getting steeper uh, slopes on the, on the spectral lines, uh, which is where the Doppler information is. But as you go from, let's say, from there to, you know, 200,000, it's a gain of 10 centimeters per second. And I don't know if I would believe that uh, enough to, to build that kind of a spectrograph, right? To build something with that high resolution. You're taking the light and you're spreading it out over a lot more pixels. So why would we waste photons on, a, on an instrument that has this crazy resolution? I would say that the answer is that because we're not trying to build spectrographs that measure Doppler shifts anymore. We're trying to build spectrographs that can actually find and model out the stellar photospheric velocities. So um, my student Alan Davis, grad student Alan Davis, carried out a simulation uh, using principal component analysis and starting with uh, spectra that Xavier had simulated with SOAP2. And we were able to look at different signal to noise levels here and at different resolutions. And then ask how many, at these, in each of these sort of grids on this, in this plot, how many principal components can we pick out, right? And so <clears throat> the answer is that if you're working here, right, which is where we work with, with Lick Observatory and with Keck Observatory, you can pull out, you know, one principal component. What you've done is you've taken the spectral line and you've binned down the information so that the stellar photospheric velocities are completely blended with any Doppler shifts. You can't, there's, it's hard to separate them. It's like if I take a picture of you guys with one of those old digital cameras that has 256 by 256 pixels, you'll see kind of that there are people in the room, but you won't see any details of their faces. Okay. Um, so, uh, and there's, so there are a couple things to note, that if we go to very high resolution up here and very high signal to noise, we can begin to pull a lot of information out of the spectra. And what it means to detect four principal components instead of, let's say, two or three, is that we're starting to see in this time series data variability in the variations, right? The spot is moving across the star and it's behaving differently. So this is a good place to be, but it's a really hard place to be. There are only a few stars uh, that you could imagine looking at with this kind of resolution and this kind of signal to noise. The sun is one of them. Um, and I would say Alpha Sin <laughs> A and B, but you guys know about the great solar uh, at Harps North, the solar uh, telescope that's, that's doing this experiment. If you look at where Harps is, you know, Harps is, is operating here, nested in here. So they're able to pull out more information um, and I think it's no surprise then that they're doing better. There's also a trade-off. So I could say, but I don't want to build a spectrograph that's a resolution of 200 so I can get into this blue zone. I want to build one that's a resolution of 100. And what I'll do is I'll just go to higher signal to noise. Um, that's fine. But if you look at the cost, right, why didn't you want to go to high resolution? Well, maybe because you didn't want to, that was, it came at some cost of exposure time. You had exposure times. But it turns out that the resolution uh, increase, sorry, the exposure time increases linearly with the resolution. It increases with the square of the signal to noise. So you actually get where you want to be faster um, by, I think, going to higher resolution. So we've been carrying out more uh, sophisticated um, analyses uh, with this, with principal components, looking at spots of different sizes, looking at faculty of, of different sizes, and trying to figure out, you know, what resolution, what is the optimal resolution and the opti optimal signal to noise so that you can really extract the most information. Um, I think all of this analysis is like the very first baby step. It tells me that there's information in the spectra. It doesn't tell me how I'm going to get the information out, right? It doesn't tell me how I'm going to still disentangle these two techniques. And so to do that, we're going on to different types of spec, um, statistical analysis, um, which are things like sparse functional principal component analysis. There are a number of techniques that are being used um, that we can apply um, and improve and develop. And the idea is kind of like this. This is my kindergarten understanding of some of these techniques, is that you may have a whole stack of images 
which are distorted in some way. They're blurred, they're skewed, there's some color that's off. Um, but to, if, there's, if there are a stack of these images, then by looking how, the, there, how much variability there is along one pixel, the statisticians can figure out what sort of weight to give for the reconstruction. Right? And so in this process, you can actually figure out what is the, the atom that caused the blurring, what is the atom that causes the smearing, and what is the atom that causes the Doppler shift. So our hope is that we're going to be able to keep pushing. Right now we're kind of just hacking through um, and trying to figure out how we can actually separate out these, the noise from the signal so that we can reconstruct a Doppler signal that has much more um, Precision, And I would say every week I feel more encouraged even than the week before. Um, the next thing that's going to hurt us, though, is uh, telluric contamination. So this picture really doesn't do uh, justice uh, to the amount of telluric contamination that you can get and the effect that microtellurics can have even in the visible uh, wavelengths. Um, there are a lot of telluric lines. It's sort of it's staggering, which um, makes it really hard. I think, to, to do near-infrared precision spectroscopy from the ground. You can probably model out the telluric lines. We're, we're working on this, um, and other people are working on this as well. As long as the telluric lines are on the linear curve of growth, um, when you get into these saturated bands that are opaque, you, all you can do is, uh, is mask them out. So uh, one question um, that I've been asking myself is whether or not it's time for us to go to space to do this work, right? If you go to space, there are two advantages that I really like. Number one, no telluric contamination. You just bypass this problem completely. Number two, uh, from space, the stars are about a milliarc second, and you can imagine using a single mode fiber and getting a significant amount of encircled energy into that single mode fiber. Single mode fiber spectrographs are a pain because of the little five micron diameter fibers, um, but they're great because they only propagate a single mode, right? The multi-mode fibers, um, especially when you have coherent light sources, end up with a lot of modal noise. Uh, this is a noise source. You're trying to have a perfect spectrum that has a signal to noise of a thousand. It's very high fidelity, and you just dumped everything into a multi-mode fiber where you have a new noise floor that's being set by speckles. So if you could use a single mode fiber, um, then we would have no problem with our laser frequency combs um, and with, um, with our science uh, targets. Here's just a little image of some telluric lines marching across. You can see the sodium D lines here over time, uh, some Chiron data that I obtained. So it's, it's, it can be quite sobering uh, of a problem. So um, we are now building Express, and this will be our third spectrograph that we built. Um, we built a spectrograph for Lithuania. It's not for planet hunting, but it was a white pupil design, and it was a great experience. Um, we're trying to take everything that we know and talk to our friends like Andy St. Yorgi here and Francesco Pepe um, to try and figure out how we really drive this down. And we come up with... Uh, uh, you know, a system engineering error budget for the radial velocity precision. And honestly, most, many of these things are wags, uh, sorry, guesses. Um, we don't really know what the, what the values will be. We're just, you know, putting in our, our best guesses. One of the jobs of one of my um, graduate students, like uh, Pajorski, who I think was here, will be to actually quantify exactly the impact of all of these errors as we commission express. But... From the instrument, we're hoping to get down to an instrumental precision of about 15 centimeters per second. And if I had to guess, I would say guess that, you know, um, g clef is going to do this and Espresso is going to do this. And the big question for all of us is going to be how do these two things play into our ability to reach this really high usable precision, the telluric contamination and the astrophysical noise. So the telescope that we're uh, going to be using is the a uh, 4.3-meter Discovery Channel telescope, which is at, uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. There's Dynavac. They're actually building our, um, our vacuum enclosure right now. Um, and we will be commissioning it in about a year. Um, I tried to make a list of things that I think are, um, will be unique for this instrument. Um, and I know that uh, some of these things are being, uh, will be, appear in future generation spectrographs as well, um, because some of them I learned from Andy Sanyorgi about G-Clef. 
So we will have a laser frequency comb from Minlo Systems that will give us um, delta function uh, uh, wavelength sampling and PSF sampling from about 450 nanometers up to about 700 nanometers. Our resolution will be 150,000, and that was a resolution that we had to set, you know, when we proposed for the instrument through the um, MRI program, NSF MRI program. Um, now it's been almost, um, I don't know, two and a half years ago, I guess. Uh, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, um, we would have driven this up to about 250,000. And again, it comes back to the fact that I'm not trying to build necessarily an instrument just to... You know, just to find more planets or just to do test support. We want to do all those things, but what we're really trying to do is see what, you know, do an experiment and see what difference in the field is this going to make. Um, we're doing 2D flat fielding uh, using a wide flat fiber, um, which I think will be nice because we have such, normally if you flat field through your science fiber, then you have uh, so few photons at the edges of the slit function. Um, we've been working with Fiber Tech Optica to build, um, instead of a quartz lamp, right, which is hot in the red and has almost no flux in the blue, so you use all sorts of filters to try and push down the red flux so that you can build up the blue flux. Um, so we have a system of 25 LEDs, and we've tuned the LEDs. You can adjust the voltage on them so that it has an inverse spectral response to our instrument. It's not just flat, like a laser-driven light source. It's actually stronger in the blue, right, and, and a little weaker in the red, so that it will have across our entire CCD um, a truly flat um, uh, calibration source for the pixel-to-pixel -pixel QE variations. Um, we, again, taking a lead from Andy, um, have optimized the camera design so that it's stable to changes in the pupil illumination. Um, and that means that it's, I think of it kind of as a... Um, uh, like a sta one of the stabilized cameras. So if something does move in the spectrograph, then the PSF will still stay uh, fairly constant. And the PSF is designed, that, or the camera is designed so that we have a PSF that's symmetrical and, um, and nearly uniform across the whole detector. I would like to figure out a way to use this information in the Doppler analysis as we go forward. We will have focus control, which I think Andy doesn't approve of, but uh, I am sort of feel like a control freak. I want to make sure that that instrument, there's no drift. It will most of the time probably the focus motor will be off, but we still have that ability. We'll be working on telluric modeling. And then I think that the best thing is that we have um, an agreement with the DCT where we have between 50 to 70 nights per year. But the DCT has an instrument port um, with, with has uh, an instrument cube with five ports, and the tertiary mirror can rotate between the ports in less than a minute. So as long as your instruments are hot, right, at the beginning of the night, you can um, actually observe for partial nights a little at the beginning of the night or the end of the night. And this is all, the instrument is all described um, in this article, uh, SPI article by uh, Colby Jerkinson. Okay, so just uh, sort of close with a few thoughts. Um, if we can separate out the jitter, the photospheric velocities, then we have a hope of improving the radial velocity precision to better than a half a meter per second. If we don't do that, if we don't reach that goal, then I think that the future of exoplanets in terms of characterization and everything else is going to have a much flatter trajectory, future trajectory. I think that radial velocity measurements offer a great opportunity um, because uh, we can work with the pixel to pick, right? 400,000 pixels gives you a lot to work with to try and figure out where the stellar variability is coming from and to separate that out. Other techniques that are exciting are astrometry, right? So Mike Shaw is talking about building um, a, a space-based astrometry probe that might get nano arc second do nano arc second astrometry. But if that's true, then at least for stars that are relatively close, the photocenters will still shift around uh, because of spots and faculae, and all you have are, is the brightness of the star to work with. You don't have this spectral information that we have with radio velocities. Um, if the new statistical techniques that uh, th folks are working on in the community um, and our team is working on are successful, then I think optical spectroscopy is kind of the way to go. 
Um, I think that we, if we can, if we can sort out, disentangle those velocities, then I think we'll bypass some of the advantages of infrared um, spectroscopy. Um, the advantage being, right, with the cryres, cryres data, where you saw that the contrast was much lower in the infrared. Um, and I think here that big advantage is that the telluric lines that are there are microtelluric lines. They're on the linear curve of growth, and we maybe have some chance of modeling them out. Um, I think that statistical analysis techniques that only operate on the one number, the radial velocities, these are the line bisectors, the full width, uh, full width half max variations, things like that, are probably limited. They're never going to be absolutely correct. Um, and so we'll be stuck at, let's say, a half a meter per second to a meter per second, which is still a really solid place to work. Um, but it's not going to propel the field of exoplanet detection forward in the same way that we could do if we could get really down to 10 centimeters per second or better precision. So uh, interestingly, uh, we've all shunned these young active stars that are chromospherically you know, active. Um, but these are the signals that are going to be the easiest to correct with all of these techniques that we're developing. So it opens up the possibility of carrying out Doppler surveys on young stars and studying planet formation as a function of, you know, the evolution of stars. So that would be really cool. And then for Avi Loeb, uh, once we find all of these planets, um, then we'll have a sample to try and figure out whether or not there's life on them. And I do, uh, I, I am sort of convinced that, you know, it's great if you can find that shortcut and, and just get a, a signal, but um, we're taking a methodical sort of view. And my hope is that in the next, you know, uh, decade or two decades, we will have the first evidence that suggests that there's life elsewhere, but there's going to come a point where the field of searching for biosignatures will have grown to such a point that we'll be able to make a statement about whether or not you know, what fraction of rocky planets, let's say with water, have life? And that is going to be a really exciting time. So I just want to end with this slide and a plug. Um, I'm a co-chair on Louvoir. Um, Louvoir is not a French word. Do not pronounce it Louvoir. <laughs> okay? It stands for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Survey Telescope. And the idea is to build a telescope, uh, and Paul Hertz says, tell me what we can do with a 12-meter telescope, then put another ring of mirrors around it so it's 16 meters, park it at L2. We're going to, all of these flagship missions have to be serviceable, whether they're serviced or not. Uh, but at L2, it takes a couple weeks, but you could imagine sending astronauts there, you know, once every decade or so. Uh, it would reinvigorate the astronaut prog uh, program. <laughs> it would help us to tap into <laughs> to that virtual firewall within NASA where astrophysics sits on one side and manned exploration has that big fat budget on the other side. Um, so I don't think we should just think in terms of, wait, how much is that going to cost? Um, it's also a mission that would have to be done like as a global project, right, with a lot of partners. Um, and it could be a telescope that lasts not for a few years and then the cryogens run out, but we could imagine having a telescope that might last for decades or for a century. Um, I would like to think uh, just a little bit bigger than this vision. Um, NASA's carrying out four studies right now. Louvoir is one, HABEX is another, the Far Infrared Surveyor and the X-ray Surveyor are the other two. So I think we should just take over L2. Right? Let's make the L2 observatory. We'll put up a giant telescope like that that serves the cosmic origins, that has a coronagraph to be able to take spectra of exoplanet atmospheres, but that also has a far infrared surveyor so that we can see the atmospheres of the planets at 20 microns or, or 30 microns or whatever it is that we need, um, and an X-ray an surveyor. And that has partners, global partners, who are not just contributing one uh, instrument, because I think, you know, uh, our partners, uh, our, our colleagues are more ambitious than this right now, um, but they at the L2 Observatory can contribute maybe one of these whole facilities, a far infrared uh, telescope, for example. Um, and I think that is the, a vision um, that I'm excited to, to, to be a part of it right now in the early stages, and although I won't get to see it launched in whenever it will be, probably 2030s, 2040s. Um, it will be a really great thing for the future of humanity and astronomers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.
So the, the, the uh, book is now open for questions. Roseanne. I have one question and a comment. Um, these variations that you're seeing that are your noise, right. um, could some of them be in fact uh, be also related to the orbits of planets, so planet-star interaction? Right. So in essence, you know, I'm thinking if the planets are close enough, yeah. you may be able to enhance your study yeah. by having studied Noise. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. The question is whether or not with um, when you have planets that are very close, especially the maybe the more massive planets that have tidal interactions with the atmosphere of the star, can you see you know the activity maybe of the star changing, or can you see some synchronization of spots or faculty or anything you know with the planets? And I think that is a really interesting thing to look at. Yeah. And then the comment has to do with finding masses. I know yeah. you made a very famous quote of, that people quote all the time, things uh -huh. that you said about <laughs> micro <-pressure. laughs> Yeah, right. Exactly. That, uh, well, you can probably say that. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> you're looking for planets oh, right. around stars that you can't right. see. And right. then no, I saw Jennifer. <laughs> right. Yeah, so Scott Gowdy would just would not let that die. It was, you know, two, in 2000, I was a lot younger, and I went to this conference in South Africa uh, on microlensing, which was really uh, a lot of fun. And But as I was listening to them, I, I just, yeah, I did sort of spontaneously say, wait, I don't get it. You're looking for planets? that you can't see around stars that you can't see, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, so that's well, right. What I was trying to say, though, <laughs> is that now what we're, we're making an effort to actually identify stars that we know have a very good chance of producing those events. Right. So studying these events right. of, you know, around stars that we can see yeah. and planets that we can follow up on. Right. Right. And I... And I I, right, because I was so provocative. I do want to say that the field of microlensing, it's astonishing how much things have changed and the, the tools that, that folks are developing to really track down the stars and, and to be able to, with this parallax method, to figure out the masses. So I have a question. Yes. So when you get to three or four principal components, right. are you going to have a physical model for what each of them is telling you, or are you just going to let your statistician friends say, oh, it's there. Right, 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 right. So, um, so I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that we will not be using principal component analysis when we take our next step. All we used it for at this early <coughs> stage was to sort of get a sense of the information content in the spectrum and to see how the, the trade-offs between the signal to noise and the resolution. So the next steps are going to be completely different um, techniques, which will allow us to actually separate out and model some of these uh, phenomena which will have you know, physical interpretations. Okay. Yes. It was great to uh, hear all about the I have a question. At the beginning, you say uh, that so we don't know the densities of the planets. So how do you actually determine the density? Is there a way to determine the density? I mean, um, so the if you had the masses, then you could determine, right? And you have the radii from the transiting planets, then you could obviously calculate the densities. And, but the, I think the one I, the case I was referring to with all the osmium planets were people, folks who had used um, a paper by Weiss and Marcy where they come up with a statistical um, the, uh, correlation or uh, analysis that allows them to come up with a mass radius relation. And so then my students were blindly using that and applying it to their specific um, stars and planets. So yeah, I think it's hard to do that. So planets aside, yeah. what you're actually saying, you'll be able to learn a lot about the stars, the yes. variability and all kinds of scales and model, and that's a tremendous right, thing. Right, right, exactly. Um, I, I do think, I was, I, was, I, I guess I, was, I may be talking to Bob Cruz a little bit about this, that you know, I've been talking to folks about, shouldn't we have a probe class mission that does radial velocities from space for the two reasons that I outlined? But then I said, but if we do that, we have to be able to look at the sun. How are we going to do that? And uh, it was Chaz Beichman who says, let's take a one centimeter telescope and poke a hole in the solar arrays. Right? And it'll have a wide field of view. And we'll get these killer time series 
uh, spectra of uh, incredible resolution going from 0.4 to 2 microns for the sun. That would be really fun. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. Um, so I know that you know the number of observations is going to affect how uh, easily things are to disentangle sort of from the planetary signals. But what about as Xavier de Musk has put a couple papers out about now? the actual timing of the observations, because we see that if you time them at certain yeah. um, in intervals, it's easy to sort of pull some of these stellar uh, signals out. So have you factored that into these simulations at all for future observations with better uh, technology? Yeah, so the so I have him on the team, so that's part of the good news. Um, and I think that what he's talking about is the timing, in other words, if you take, he's trying to average over granulation modes, right? And so he's shown that if you take spectra that are separated by hours, that you can begin to sort of beat down the granulation noise. So that's definitely one approach for doing that. Um, and the P-mode oscillations you can average over, but it gets really hard to average over um, spots rotating on the surface and faculty. Um, maybe and meridional flows, things that we still don't even know. So I think that, that might end up being tough, but it's one, one of the tools that we have to use. Well, I think, let's mm -hmm. thank our speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>